Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Mary Balliet. And we'd like to start today by talking about how do I reduce side effects from the medicine I need to take. So this is a presentation aimed at the consumer, all of the patients, all of us who are on some kind of medication. And all medication is known to have side effects. So we're going to really look at why are there side effects and what can I do to reduce those side effects. So the first thing we want to really take a look at is the fact that two thirds of all Americans are on at least one prescription drug, but more than four out of 10 older adults take five or more medications. That means that the overall rate of what is called polypharmacy is 17%. If you think about that, that's almost one in five people are on more than one medication. That is a lot of people having to take some kind of medicine to have a good quality of life. The problem is that there are risks to medication. It's possible that you're going to have this second point here that you're gonna have side effects of drugs. And that is due to the nutrients that are depleted. And that's gonna be what we're really gonna talk about today. But the World Health Organization says that more than 50% of drugs consumed worldwide are prescribed or dispensed inappropriate, inappropriately. And almost half of all patients use drugs incorrectly. And this can lead to sickness or even death. Sickness would be called morbidity, and death would be called mortality. So we really don't wanna have that. We wanna know that the medication we're taking is helping us and not hurting us. So the thing I wanted to start it with today is the medication that's incredibly common. The majority of women in their reproductive years are under are taking some kind of our hormonal birth control. According to the CDC, between 2017 and 2019, 65% of women in the United States are using some type of hormonal birth control. And I have all these lists over here. That means that they all have some hormones in them. 38.7% of women age 15 to 19, so these are very young women, are on hormonal birth control. But 75% of women between 40 and 49 are on hormonal birth control. What are the side effects of birth control? Well, you can have breakthrough bleeding, it's called, or spotting. This is the most common when you have what's called continuous dosing or extended cycle pills. This is when you are on, say, the, um, the patch. This can happen. Women can get breast tenderness. Also, nausea, headaches, bloating, and increases in your blood pressure. And we can see these all can possibly start to get better the longer you're on it and your body gets used to it. But we're going to really talk about mitigating these because the majority of these side effects are actually due to the nutrition that is depleted while you're on the birth control pill. So we want to have it that you can have the positive benefit of hormonal birth control without the negative side effects. How about hormonal replacement therapy after menopause? 44% of postmenopausal women report having used hormone replacement therapy. 40% use pills. Another 10% use cream or suppository or some kind of injection. And skin patches are another 4%. And some women do more than one. They may take the pills, but also then do the cream. Now, the reason that women do better on hormone replacement therapy is it gets rid of hot flashes and mood swings and vaginal dryness and the problem with concentrating. But the side effects that were shown in the nurses' study that caused women to way decrease the amount of hormone replacement therapy was the risk of strokes and blood clots, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and gallstones. But I want to show you that you can, the majority of women, not every woman, you have to talk to your doctor, but the majority of women can have the positive benefit of both birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy when they have the nutrition that is depleted. If the side effects go away, that is a sign 
that the side effects were only due to the drug-induced nutrient depletion. So what do they deplete? We can see that oral contraceptives or any kind of rings that contain the hormones or the patches or an IUD, if it has hormones in it, it depletes vitamins B6, magnesium, B1, B2, B3, B5, folic acid, and B12. That is all the B vitamins plus magnesium. There are some research papers that also say that they may deplete the amino acid tyrosine. And there are some papers that say they can have even more impact than that. If we look at the things that are on the right-hand side, we can see these are all the side effects that we just talked about on the last slide. Cardiovascular risk, like heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots, that's due to the combination of the B6 and magnesium being missing because it's getting depleted in order to break down the birth control pills in your liver. When I have cramping, that can also be magnesium deficiency. When I am deficient in my B1, B2, B3 energy and B5, then I'm gonna have a lot of fatigue and my mitochondria can't work. And if my mitochondria can't work, any area of my body that's a little bit weak will break down. Folic acid and B12 are very important to get rid of homocysteine levels. And we have a whole presentation about that. So I would like you to watch that at another time. And homocysteine is the cause of the cardiovascular problems. But when I use B6, B9, which is folic acid and B12 together, then we eliminate both the anemia and the homocysteine levels. And it is the loss of those vitamins and the increase in the homocysteine that leads to the neurological diseases. So again, it's very important to replete all of these vitamins and the mineral magnesium. For women on hormone replacement therapy, they have some impact on all the B vitamins, but way more impact on B6 and magnesium. And so that's just showing those again there. So the take home message for hormone replacement therapy of either birth control pills or HRT postmenopausally is that we want to replete those vitamins that are missing. Now, why is that? There is the mechanism of why I get a drug induced nutrient depletion on birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy. And that is because every single medication that is over the counter or a prescription that has to be detoxified in the liver, which is the majority of them. It's not all of them, but a good 75% of all over-the-counter medications, prescription and, and prescription medication is broken down. And so it can be gotten rid of. That's why I have to take it every day in the cytochrome P450 system. If I look at the cytochrome P450 system over here, it is a liver pathway. And what the liver does is it has two steps. In step one, I actually burn up the medicine. So step one is what's called an oxidation step. When I do oxidation or burning, I need all of my B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, energy, B5. To make more mitochondria, I also need 6, 9, 12, the methylators. So I need all my B vitamins. And so that's why folic acid is there, especially in this step, or why you get more depleted in it. I'm going to have to break this down. It's very important when I am on fire because I'm burning that I have antioxidants. The most famous antioxidant in the liver is this glutathione, but I can do other antioxidants as well, like turmeric, like ginger, like cinnamon, like all of the colors of fruits and vegetables. Those are really important antioxidants. There are things that upregulate step one or increasing burning things. And one of the best examples is the herb milk thistle. So if I really need to upregulate this, milk thistle can help upregulate. It's kind of like adding another match to the fire. It'll upregulate that if you feel like you're not getting enough fire. Carotenoids, which is basically beta carotene and all the other carotenoids that are in orange and vegetables and any vegetable that turns yellow or orange as it goes bad, those are very important antioxidants for the step as is vitamin A. 
If you are vitamin A deficient and E together, you can get xenol cataracts. And so this is how, when I am on a lot of medication that can increase the aging of patients. And then vitamin C recycles vitamin E. So in that way, vitamin C does many, many functions, but it has part of it as a recycling of vitamin E in the antioxidant stages. Who needs to burn things? Anything that I'm eating in my diet, that besides hormone replacement therapy, if I've been exposed to a pollutant, I have non-organic food that has insecticides or pesticides, I'm adding food additives. Those are the colors and the dyes and things when you cover up the label or you read the label, you're like, what is this? Because it's not listed on the nutrition part of it. So it's not protein or carbohydrates or fats or vitamins or minerals. That would be a food additive. It has to be burned. You're taking, as I'm saying, majority of drugs going through the Cytochrome P450 system or you're drinking alcohol. And this is why additional drugs or alcohol can really have a big impact on birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy because now I'm increasing how much fire I'm going to need. Now, if I have these toxins, which we're going to say are like tires and they're in your field, not so great, right? But tires on fire are much more dangerous. So you have to put the fire out. So once I burn these, you would think, well, then they're less harmful, but they're actually more harmful unless I put the fire out. And that's called state two or phase two liver detox. I need a lot of amino acids, 40% of, well, actually a lot of people don't get enough protein, but for people over 50, 30% of men and 50% of women do not get enough protein. If they do not get enough protein, then what happens is I don't have all these amino acids. I don't have L-glutamine, which comes in chicken and chicken soup and uh, bone broth. I don't have enough glycine, which is a very common amino acid in all protein, but it is known to be in collagen, probably why a lot of people like that. Um, but as long as you have enough protein, every protein has enough glycine in it. Taurine, which is made from cysteine, is made from sulfur-containing amino acids, which are found in things like cruciferous vegetables and asparagus and eggs and onions. And that's why these are so important. When we talk about these phytochemicals that are found in garlic, and the cruciferous vegetables and asparagus, we are talking about the sulfur containing elements that are gonna help put the fire out. Once the fire is out, there's two things that can happen. We're now, we, we took the drug, can't have it in our body, we need it for one day, then we have to burn it, that's why we have to take it the next day, it's how the liver works. Then I put the fire out. If the fire was made from something that's fat soluble, it will have to go out through your bile. That means I have to have my gallbladder working well and the liver has to work well so that I can actually move the bile through the liver into the gallbladder and then put it in the bowel. I only do this for fat solubles if I eat fat at every single meal. So it's really important to have good fats some omega-6 fatty acids, they are essential. Omega-6 fatty acids get us a lot of bad rap, but the bottom line is they are essential at almost 11 to 17 grams a day. That's about a good tablespoon of omega-6 fatty acids. It's not a no-fat diet. It's the right fat diet. Do I need the omega-3 fatty acids that are the good guys, everyone says? Yes, of course I do, because that's really good for my heart health and my brain health, but I still must have those omega-6 fatty acids and I must eat good fats at every meal. So good fats that come in nuts and seeds are really, really important so that when I put the fire out on those fat-soluble vitamins, on those fat-soluble compounds that have been burned, I can then have the bile flow, that takes fat, it also takes vitamin C. I cannot make bile without vitamin C. And so those two things, eating fruit and having good fats, then will allow me to put that bile in the bowel. Now, what's important as well is that I have to eat fiber. If I don't eat fiber, then this bile is going to be reabsorbed and it's going to go back to the gallbladder and back out. 
Now I'm going to have bile that's not fresh. And that's how a lot of people can get gallstones. And that's what we saw on the side effects that you can get gallbladder disease. You will not get gallbladder disease if you do things like drink hot water with lemon and I eat all my cruciferous vegetables and I have enough protein and I eat fat at every meal, the good omega-6s, the good omega-3s. And now I have fiber that binds the bile and now I'm going to poop it out and get rid of those toxins. The water soluble ones, I'm gonna have to put through the kidneys and out in the urine because it shouldn't be called you're in, it should be called you're out. What do I need in order to make urine? I need water. Can you have iced tea? Can you have soda? Can you have juice? Would you do your dishes in it? If the answer is no, then the answer is no. You need water because water is going to flush out that system and let you take those water soluble toxins out through the urine. So we want to have for this to remind ourselves good fat, omega 6s, and omega 3s. We want to also have vitamin C, we want to have water, fat, and we want fiber, fat, fiber, vitamin C, water. That's going to help us both get rid of these toxins after step two. Step one, I need my B vitamins, I need my antioxidants because I'm going to burn everything. There are two things that we have to be very cautious of for upregulating phase one or the burning impact. Some medicines need to be in your system to have an impact. We do not want to upregulate the detoxification of them. We want them to stay around the right amount of time. So we don't want to get rid of them too fast or too slow. So on the last slide, we're talking about getting rid of them at the right speed. What about getting rid of them too fast? Grapefruit juice and St. John's wort. This is a picture of St. John's wort. This is grapefruit juice. They have the largest drug interactions. Why? Because they interact with the cytochrome P450 system and upregulate it. Therefore, now I don't have enough antibiotic to fight infections. I don't have enough birth control to not get pregnant. I don't have enough hormone replacement therapy, so I don't have hot flashes, so I don't have vaginal dryness. This is why we want to avoid the grapefruit juice and the St. John's wort when I'm on things that I need to have in my body at the right level every day. And so you have to be very, very cautious and read the label and make sure that you're not doing grapefruit juice and St. John's wort if you're on the medication that it is contraindicated in, which is the majority of medicines, unfortunately, because the majority of medicines go through the cytochrome P450 system. Now, I need 100% of the B vitamins when I'm on birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy. But for vitamin B6, I need more, way more than the RDA. I need 25 to 50 milligrams of vitamin B6. Now, I recommend vitamin B6 over here as pyridoxal 5-phosphate. I just did a screenshot of all the places that make pyridoxal 5-phosphate. This is the active form of vitamin B6. And I believe that some women lack the enzyme to make the active form of B6. And that's why they have a lot of side effects. So I think for the extra, go ahead and have it as pyridoxal 5-phosphate. For magnesium, the most absorbable magnesium form is magnesium glycinate. Unfortunately, vitamin companies can give you magnesium oxide, which is not absorbable, put glycine in it, which we talked about the importance of glycine, but putting glycine with magnesium oxide does not make magnesium glycine, even though they can claim that it does. And the problem with that is then it's just going to help you move your bowels, not a bad thing, but it needs to get reabsorbed. It needs to get to be absorbed rather in your body so that you can actually have the benefit of the magnesium. Magnesium calms you down so you can sleep at night. Magnesium is really important for not getting smooth muscle cramping. That would be leg, that would be cramping in your legs, cramping in your abdomen, cramping in your uh, uterus, cramping in your blood vessels, which is hypertension. 80% of adult Americans are magnesium deficient. So that is a huge problem. And so I say, why not do the least expensive magnesium that's known to be well-absorbed and just go with magnesium citrate? 
If you get diarrhea on magnesium citrate, just cut back. But the RDA is 400 to 600 milligrams a day. So you may have to add as many as 300 more because you may not be getting enough during the day because of the birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy puts a lot of pressure on the magnesium and probably why sometimes on hormone replacement, you can get a bit moody because magnesium is going to really calm that down. You know that you're magnesium deficient when you crave chocolate. Chocolate happens to be very high in magnesium, as is anything that has chlorophyll, which makes it green, and in nuts and seeds. So those are the foods, nuts and seeds, chocolate, right, and greens. And so you have to have those foods, otherwise you really need it, extra magnesium. So I just did screenshots, and that way you can sort of see what's up there. Now... The next thing I wanted to talk about is how does the stomach make acid and what it's for? So we're now going to move away from hormones and talk about the next very, very common drug, and that is antacids. So we have to talk about how and why the stomach even makes acid, that there is such a drug as an antacid. So the stomach has two kinds of cells. We can see here in green, the chief cells, they make a thing called pepsinogen. And these purple cells called parietal cells, and they make two things, intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. Now this hydrochloric acid has two functions. Function number one is it converts pepsinogen to the active enzyme called pepsin, which digests your protein. When I don't have hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen converted to pepsin, then what happens is I cannot digest my protein. Hydrochloric acid also has multiple other functions. I said only two, but actually has, that's number one. Number two, it is gonna allow calcium and iron and zinc and magnesium, anything called a divalent cation. That means calcium and iron and zinc and magnesium are all in the plus two state. And it can't stay there without the hydrochloric acid. It needs it for the transporter for those ions to get through. And hydrochloric acid opens the pyloric sphincter. So this, called the pyloric sphincter, which is between the stomach and your duodenum, which is the beginning of your small intestine, is an acid-dependent sphincter. If I'm on an antacid, and now I cannot make any acid, then I cannot open the sphincter. I can't digest my protein and I cannot absorb my calcium, iron, zinc, and magnesium. Where then is it gonna go that acid or lack of acid, not much acid? It's gonna go up into my esophagus. This is called the lower esophageal sphincter. We need this to be closed. We need this to be open. We want the food to go this way, not that way. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a very serious disease, but it is not a disease of too much stomach acid. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, is really a problem of this, the lower esophageal sphincter. And truthfully, it's due to not enough acid, not too much acid. So let's take a look at that in a moment. We'll talk about one more thing, and that's this intrinsic factor. This is going to allow you to have B12 to be absorbed. So if I mess with my parietal cells, I, I can get B12 deficient. And B12 is the thing that leads to cardiovascular disease and neurological problems and anemia. So I don't want to be on long-term antacids. It can have a lot of impact on bizarrely my cardiovascular health. So that is an issue. So let's take a look at the mechanism of drug-induced nutrient depletion for antacid. Because it interferes with the digestion and or absorption of the nutrients, not such as protein, calcium, iron, zinc, magnesium, and B12, I'm at risk for osteoporosis. This is a huge problem. Osteoporosis can lead to a hip fracture as we age, and this is why it's important to get your DEXA scan. You want to have good quality bone. This is a strong bone. It can hold up against weight or a fall. This is porous bone. It's not going to be strong. And now if I have a fall, and that's why older people don't like to fall, now they can have a risk that they're going to break this, the hip. 
We don't want that. And we want them, and just taking calcium won't make any difference if I don't have stomach acid. Just taking calcium and I can have protein, which is the whole structure of the bone. I also need magnesium and zinc in order to make the builders of the bone. And I need iron to make the red blood cells so that I can bring oxygen to the bone. So all of these things are necessary and I need B12 in order to make enough red blood cells that have the iron in it so that I can drive to the bone, which, uh, you know, because it's, those red blood cells are made in the bone. So like it's all goes together. So it's a huge problem. And so what we really wanna be cautious about this. So who needs antacids they have to be doing something good for some people, but the bottom line is it has to do with GERD. GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And DACIDs are one of the major classes of over-the-counter medications sold globally. And consumers with acid indigestion and heartburn spend billions of dollars on these non-prescription drugs in search of relief. This paper just came out in 2022. What else did this paper say? Two out of five people had GERD in the past. One out of third had GERD last week. And 50% of people who take what's called a proton pump inhibitor or a very serious antacid like Prilosec have persistent symptoms. That means it's not working. If one third of people are doing and half of them, it's not working. Why is that? It's because we're not treating the actual cause of the problem. The cause of gastroesophageal reflux disease is this sphincter should be closed. And if it's open, then the acid that's in your stomach, which you have to have, is going to come up in the esophagus. That is very bad because it will burn the esophagus. It cannot burn the stomach. The stomach has no capacity to be burned by hydrochloric acid, only the esophagus. We cannot have that. And so that is why if that it's happening that the lower esophageal sphincter is opening, we want to have an antacid. So let's talk about what's going to cause that and how we're going to fix it and really get the positive benefit without the negative side effects. One, we eat a big meal and lie down after eating. No, that's not a good idea. Why? I lay back. Now my sphincter opens, food comes up. I got to be upright. I need gravity. Food needs to go down. I'm really stressed out. In a really stressed out environment, what happens is you have to be in rest and digest in order to make stomach acid. If I'm under so much stress, I'm in fight or flight, I don't make enough stomach acid. Let's go back. Why is that a problem? That's a problem because I'm not opening my pyloric sphincter. Now food's going to stay in my stomach. I'm going to be like, oh, I feel like I have indigestion. That's called lack of acid indigestion. Now food's not going down. It can only come up. So very important not to be stressed out when you're eating. So if you're really stressed out and now I'm going to eat under stress and then worse, I'm going to eat under stress and lie down, that's going to definitely come into a problem. So I want to be calm when I'm eating. I want to be upright when I'm eating. I don't want to be reclining when I'm eating. I want to be upright. I want gravity working for me. I want to make sure I'm not stressed while I'm eating. I don't want to be eating quite on the go. That's a big problem in America. I want to sit, be calm, have acid, be upright, have it go down. What about smoking? Smoking, unfortunately, does two things. That does make more stomach acid and it does relax the sphincter. The majority of people who smoke get gastroesophageal reflux disease. Really the treatment is they have to stop smoking since they're likely to stop smoking since smoking is the most addictive uh, drug on the market. Nothing is more addictive than smoking. Then what happens is they may need to be on an antacid, but we're gonna see they also need to then take some enzymes so that they can actually digest their food and have food go down. And unfortunately, minty, fabulous, before you eat, so that it opens all the sphincters so food can go down terrible after you eat, because then food can come out. And chewing gum, mint gum, not so great for this, because it then can open that sphincter. And now I just bend over, and now food is going to come up, and I'm going to feel like it's in my throat, and I'm going to have pain behind my breastbone where my esophagus is. So... No, lying down after I eat, be calm when I'm eating, should not smoke, 
meant before but not after I eat. Doing now dacids, the literature in 2022, very clear, unlikely that if you buy an over-the-counter medication, it has not been prescribed by your doctor, likely it will not work. At least 50% of the time, it will not help you. How do I know if I have too much acid or too little? There is a thing called the baking soda test. Remember when you were in middle school and you made that volcano and you took the vinegar and you took the baking, put the baking soda in there and you added the vinegar and all bubbled out? That's how we're going to do it. We're going to take four ounces of cold water. We're going to do it early in the morning before we eat or drink. So we're just going to get up. We're going to mix one quarter teaspoon of baking soda in four ounces of cold water. We're going to stir it up. We're going to drink the four ounces. It's not a lot, but we have to drink the whole thing. We're going to set the timer the minute you drink it. You need to burp in three to five minutes. If you do not burp within five minutes, you have not enough stomach acid. It is diagnostic that actually you have lack of acid indigestion, not acid indigestion. Your food is coming up. Your food is not going down. So uh, let's go back to that slide for one second. One of the reasons that a vinaigrette dressing, which has acid in it, and you have salad before you have your meal, is that will help the food go down. It is intriguing about that, right? So that now I have a vinaigrette and olive oil and vinaigrette dressing that can be really nice for this um, and do that. Or some people do a little bit of apple cider vinegar before they eat. So if you fail the baking soda test, that is a really nice thing that you can do to get the system to go in the right direction, to get the food to go down and then stay upright and calm and be able to eat. So what are the drugs that you can buy without the doctor? And so many people are buying it that we now have all this literature that is really a problem. There are things called proton pump inhibitors. When you look at the generic name, they end in O-L-E, like a miprazole. H2 histamine blockers end in I-D-I-N-E, like famitidine and Tums. They cause a depletion of protein because you cannot digest it, you're gonna lose your muscle mass. They do cause a deficiency in calcium because you cannot absorb it, you're gonna get osteoporosis, your teeth are gonna break, you're gonna get tooth decay, and your heart will not work because you need calcium for your heart to work. Iron is gonna be depleted, so you're gonna be exhausted and get anemia. You're gonna have a zinc deficiency, which is very poor wound healing. You are gonna have trouble breathing. Breathing is a zinc dependent thing. You can lose your taste, poor digestion because you can't even make hydrochloric acid without zinc. Without magnesium, you're gonna have cramping, you're gonna have a lot of trouble sleeping, but bizarrely, you're also gonna be very tired. You need to make your weight in ATP every day. ATP is considered the energy currency of the cell, but you make your weight in ATP every day. 80% of adult Americans are already magnesium deficient because they don't have enough greens that has chlorophyll, has magnesium. They don't have chocolate or they don't have nuts. And so that's a problem. And so that's why there are so many. And now folic acid and B12 together work together for most people um, to do a bunch of things. But we had a lovely talk. Actually, B12 is needed to get rid of homocysteine along with choline, which is in lecithin. And so we need lecithin in our diet if we have MTHFR, and then the B12 gets rid of the homocysteine. If we don't have it, then methylfolic acid gets rid of the homocysteine, and methyl B12 gets rid of the homocysteine. So there's a whole talk about that. But we want to just think about folic acid and B12 together for the 60% of people who don't have MTHFR. They work separately, but have really important functions when we have MTHFR. And together... They're doing many, many things for you so that you don't have anemia, you don't have homocysteine, you don't have cardiovascular disease, and your nerves are working great. So this is a big deal. And I just want to remind you again, this is something a lot of people buy without ever talking to the doctor. They haven't been to the gastroenterologist. They haven't been actually diagnosed with GERD. They diagnose themselves and they're causing all these kinds of problems for themselves and they don't even realize it. 
Some people take laxatives because they're not actually able to go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement regularly, like every day. If you eat every day, you should go every day. Why would I take a laxative? Um, why would I ever need that? Like, what did people do before there was laxatives? You know what they did? They ate fermented food, like yogurt or kimchi, things like that. And they ate fiber. The RDA for fruits and vegetables is five cups of fruits and vegetables for women and nine for men. If I don't eat enough fiber and I don't have probiotics, which is the good bacteria and the fiber that feeds them, because your bowel movement is due to 50% probiotics, 50% fiber, I don't have them, I don't drink enough water, I'm not gonna go every day. That's it, that's actually all it is. And now I might take a laxative because I feel like, oh, I have to go. Problem is, I get deficient in the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. Without A and E together, I'm going to get cataracts. Without A, I can have good night vision. I'm going to have a depressed immune system. For vitamin D, critical to absorb the calcium. We've been talking about that I need, um, I need protons or I need acid for calcium to be absorbed, but I also need vitamin D. Without vitamin D, I can't absorb the calcium either, and I'm going to lose that. And so now I'm going to be depressed, seasonal factors disorder, vitamin D critical for immune function. And we're going to talk about this later and the importance of vitamin D for all these functions. And then without E, I'm going to not only have cataracts, I'm going to have very dry skin. My hair is not going to be good. I'm going to not heal well, but I'm also going to have reproductive issues like PMS. So let's say I'm on birth control pills and I have a digestive issue. I could really ha be having some real serious issues. Now, what's interesting about vitamin K, and while I'm a fan of having some vitamin K as a as a vitamin, if you have good probiotics, you actually make vitamin K as well. And without it, you're going to bruise and have blood clotting issues. And you're going to bizarrely get osteoporosis. And that's why a lot of people say, oh, have vitamin D with K2. But the truth is, if you have a probiotic, you're going to make K2 in your colon. And that is really, you don't need extra, in my opinion, uh, but you may need extra vitamin D because if you live north, you really need extra vitamin D from uh, pretty much October to May. So that's the majority of us in the Northeast or anybody in the Northern latitude is gonna need that extra vitamin D anyway. But if you're on a laxative, you're really in trouble. So who, what other medications cause osteoporosis besides antacids, glucocorticoids, that's like prednisone. We talked about the proton pump inhibitors, but sadly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Celexa and Prozac and um, those drugs also cause calcium deficiency and can lead to osteoporosis. So those people also have to be having good quality extra calcium when they want to take it as a supplement. Don't take more than 350 at a time. Only 300 to 500 milligrams can ever get in at once. You never want to take more than that at once. You want to take a good quality calcium or you want to just count your calcium by using an app on your phone like my fitness pal and you want things like good quality dairy or nuts is very high. So like almond milk has it in there and cow's milk has it, yogurt has it, all those things and greens have it. So very important to have food sources of calcium. And can you take extra calcium? Yes, the literature for women taking supplemental calcium up to about 500 milligrams is really good in a day. I would never take a, a thousand milligrams of calcium all as a supplement and not as food. The literature on that is terrible for women. It shows that it can lead to cardiovascular issues. And for men, adding a, a lot of calcium, especially if you're doing a ton of dairy, seems to lead to some prostate issues. So we don't want to do, uh, we really want food rather than having supplements and be cautious about that on the literature for calcium. So I want to have enough, but not too much. The next thing, so we've covered hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills, because a lot, a lot of women are on that, as we saw. We've covered antacids because billions of dollars and people can do that without ever going to the doctor. So they can decide, diagnose and treat themselves without any training and may not know that they're actually causing themselves more harm than good. And then the other thing we're going to talk about now are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or the NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the most commonly prescribed class of medication for pain and inflammation. 
they're responsible for five to 10% of all medication prescribed every single year. If you are 65 or older, which I am, it is possible that 96% of people over 65 are doing it and said every single day due to arthritis pain. The problem is that NSAIDs can cause a lot of gastrointestinal toxicity. And the reason that if I'm on an NSAID, I'm going to have trouble with my stomach and now I'm going to think I need an antacid, it's not actually because they increase your stomach acid. The problem with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like naproxen, ibuprofen, Motrin, naproxen, and aspirin, all of those drugs block what's called the Cox enzyme. Now the Cox enzyme gets rid of it makes a thing called prostaglandin E, which causes pain, but also very importantly, it actually also makes thromboxanes. And that causes you to clot when you have a cut. So say you don't chew your food well, because you are a little hoover and you're just sucking it in and you're not chewing. Chewing is actually not optional. Well, now I have unchewed food in my stomach. My stomach's doing this, and I'm gonna actually slice my stomach. That's gonna lead to a lot of pain, which is called dyspepsia. I have stomach pain, that's all that means. Now, what happens is that I'm gonna get this GI bleed. That doesn't seem good to me. Now, if acid goes into the duodenum, now I can get an ulcer. I'm not gonna get GERD as much, which is weird, but I'm going to more likely have this churning thing happening because of the way that the NSAIDs work. And now acid can get into my duodenum. So I have to be cautious. So always do the lowest dose non anti-inflammatory that you can to get rid of the stomach problems. Why am I getting cardiovascular adverse effects? Well, the problem with the cardiovascular adverse effects is really due to the fact that all of a sudden now, I'm going to have um, this stroke or heart failure or hypertension because it's very counterintuitive because I just said it's so important to make thromboxanes which let you clot. So we don't want to have a bleed, but we don't want to clot where there isn't a cut. And those are called prostacyclins. Cycle on by, don't clot here because there's nothing wrong with me. But if I can't make the Cox enzymes, which is what the non anti-inflammatories inhibit, now I can't not clot when I shouldn't clot. And that can cause an infarct or a stroke. Super important, lowest dose you can ever take. Don't take it every day. Talk to your doctor, see what else you need to do. You should not be managing this yourself. Many of us are managing this ourselves, but take a look, not the best choice always and very, very tough on the kidney because it's going to have to, this is water soluble. You know, if you mix aspirin in water, it will dissolve. And if you mix ibuprofen in water, it will dissolve. This is one of those that is not going out in the bile. This is going out in your urine. This is going to have to uh, be going through your kidney. You gotta drink plenty of water if you're gonna take a non uh, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. So does it do anything else? Yes, it is going through the cytochrome P450 system. So all the stuff that we already talked about, that I need all my B vitamins and I need glutathione as an antioxidant, which is uh, really important. Glutathione is made from cysteine, which is a sulfur containing amino acid. I need other antioxidants. I need the carotenoids. I need vitamin E. I need vitamin C. I need all my amino acids and I need water, and I need vitamin C, and I need to eat fat. Wow, it's a lot to think about, because now take a look one more time. Look at this, most commonly prescribed, also very, very likely to be over the counter. Three big things, GI, toxicity, cardiovascular reverse events, and it's going to really hurt my kidney. Am I against ever doing them? Absolutely not. Pain is a terrible thing. Should not be in pain. Having to do this every day, we're gonna to have to see what are we gonna to have to do to mitigate this so we have the positive benefit when we're in pain without the negative side effects. Well, we're gonna need all those things that we talked about. We're gonna need all the B vitamins, right? 
But more importantly, we have to put the fire out. That's the main problem because we're already in flames. See, oh, that's interesting, right? If we're saying anti-inflammatory, it's because we are in flames because we didn't know how to put the fire out. So to put the fire out, very important, included thione. Now, unfortunately, acetaminophen is in more than just Tylenol. Acetaminophen is in a lot of other medication. So when you look at medication, say something like Robitussin that has acetaminophen in it, that is a hepatotoxin. That's going to really destroy your liver because it won't let you make the glutathione that we said was so important not to cause your liver to be on fire. You're already on fire. If you're taking an anti-inflammatory, you already feel inflamed. And we're going to have a lot of trouble doing phase two detoxification, which is putting the fire out in the first place. We're already on fire and now we're even more on fire. Unfortunately, ibuprofen and naproxen, the reason a lot of orthopedic surgeons don't like you to do NSAIDs is uh, at a high dose is that you won't sleep well. And if you won't sleep well, you won't heal well. Also, because they always cause a bleed, maybe not a big bleed, but they always cause at least some bleed, you have to have folic acid and iron in order not to get anemic. And without uh, enough red blood cells, then you can't heal and you can't make things that you make every day, like your hair and your skin and your nails. We are making those every single day. And if I lose folic acid and iron together, now I can't do that. And so this is why I'm not going to heal quickly. Always the lowest dose, always work with the doctor or the pharmacist. The pharmacist knows the right dose and can help you. And then salicylates are iron. Now, what's interesting, let's go back to the NSAIDs for a second. How much should I take? Well, it turns out that non steroidal anti inflammatories like ibuprofen and naproxen and naproxen, Motrin, all of those, they're what's called competitive inhibitors. So the more that I eat an inflammatory diet, and that's why the literature on omega 6 fatty acids is bad. It's not a no omega-6 fatty acid diet. It's the right amount. Omega-6 fatty acids are essential. Your body cannot make it. It's very, very important to have omega-6 fatty acids to have good hair, skin, and nails. Where we ought to have somewhere in that 11 gram to 17 gram amount. But what if I eat way more than that? Now I'm going to be more likely to be inflamed because one of the omega-6 fatty acids is called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is very high in the skin of chicken. It's very high in um, things from a cow if I don't eat grass-fed beef. And so if I don't eat grass-fed beef, then it is up. Does that mean I should never eat any beef? I say no, because I need that beef for iron and red meat is a really great source of iron, but we don't want to have too much of it, right? So it's always the baby bear amount. I don't want to have too little and be too cold like mama bear. I don't want to be too hot like copper bear. I want to be just right like baby bear. So I want to have that right amount of omega-6 fatty acids so that I have good uh, skin and hair and nails, but not so much that I'm in flames. That's important. And we know if I'm having too many omega-6 fatty acids, way too many, because I'm going to need the anti-inflammatories because I'm going to make more of what's called prostaglandin A. So we don't want to do that. I get that. That's really important. And we can balance that out by having more omega-3s. So we can have fish a couple times a week. It's really the people who are eating red meat, two meals a day or seven meals a week, that's too many. I get that. Now, the more again that I have too many omega-6s, the more ibuprofen I'm gonna need if I get in pain. Salicylates are different. Aspirin is what's called a non-competitive inhibitor. It's the same dose for everyone, one baby aspirin. Now, in the beginning, they put everyone on cardiovascular disease because they didn't want them to clot on one baby aspirin. But the literature is not good on that anymore. They're saying some people are going to do great on that and some people are not going to do great. And that's because aspirin depletes not only the folic acid and the iron that happens with the NSAIDs, but they also mess up your potassium sodium ratio, which is going to get you to have muscle weakness and an irregular heartbeat. And then because they always, always cause a bleed, there's no way you're not going to get a bleed. Now, remember, the problem is you don't want to clot. 
They give you aspirin as what's called a platelet aggregating factor inhibitor. We don't want you to clot, but if you can't clot, you can't not clot either. And so now you're gonna get a bleed. This is the problem. It's finding that sweet spot, right? And so what we wanna do is other things that are platelet aggregating factor inhibitors so we can avoid too much aspirin or having to take aspirin. And platelet aggregating factor inhibitors are things like fish oils and things like um, garlic. That is really great and ginger and turmeric. All of those things are platelet aggregating factor inhibitors. That's why they are anti-inflammatories because they work on this same system, but now they act more like a dimmer switch than just an on off light switch like aspirin does. Either it's on or it's off. Whereas if I have an herb, especially a good quality herb, then the body seems to know what it does. It dials you up when you need it and it dials you down when you don't. So it's just a lot better for you to have a more natural anti-inflammatory by having a relatively anti-inflammatory diet, eating good quality meat, good quality uh, fruits and vegetables, and not too many problematic foods that increase your inflammation, but not none, just not too many. So what about the other cardiovascular drugs that are on the market? This is the list of the big groups here. The American Heart Association reports that 82.6 million people in the US currently are on one or more, uh, have one or more forms of cardiovascular disease. The number one most common cardiovascular disease is this one right here, hypertensive heart disease. Hypertensive heart disease means that you have too much blood volume and hypertension, you're pounding all the time on your blood vessels. And that's gonna cause the blood vessels to go into coronary artery disease because they're gonna have to now put a covering over that because they're like, that's not so great. And then coronary artery disease can lead to heart failure and to stroke and to myocardial infarction and peripheral artery disease and heart failure. And then your heart's gonna have an arrhythmia. So it doesn't seem good. So hypertension, you really wanna avoid hypertension. That's super important. Now, one of the things that they give you for hypertension, well, there's many things they give you for hypertension and that is beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So uh, beta blockers don't let you constrict your blood vessels, which is why then you're gonna pound on them even more. And an ACE inhibitor inhibits what's called your renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And it's gonna not let you reabsorb too much water. Now, what's interesting about these two things right down here, you really want your cells to have water rather than your blood to have water. You wanna urinate the right amount and you want, there's only two places water can be. The water can be in your body, that is. It could be in your cell and you're a grape, or it can be in your blood and then your cells are raisins and your blood has too much blood in it. So you want to have the right vitamins so that you can pee the extra water out, but you want to have the right protein, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, so that you can pull the water in to your blood, to your cells. So now you're a grape, not a raisin, and you're not hypertensive. That's really the key. But if you don't do that, then they're likely to put you on a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. Problem is that these cause serious drug-induced side effects. Also, we said we want to not let you clot. And that's why we're doing aspirin and other platelet aggregating factor inhibitors because we don't want you to clot. But don't forget, if you can't clot, you're always going to bleed. They go together. They're made in the same pathway, just by different cells. So it always, always, always happens. It's not truly a side effect, it's an unwanted effect, always gonna happen. And then one out of every four or five adults over 40 is on a statin drug. And we're gonna see that has really big drug-induced nutrient depletion as well. So let's take a look. The big three, statin drugs, beta blockers, and metformin, which is for keeping your blood sugar under control if you're diabetic, they deplete CoQ10. CoQ10 is the most important anti-inflammatory in your mitochondria. Your mitochondria, if they do not have CoQ10, they die. If they die, you will not have any energy and you will not have good function. Who has the most mitochondria per unit of tissue? Your heart, followed by your brain and your nervous system, and then your skeletal muscle. 
your heart and they're giving me a statin drug and beta blockers and metformin for my heart and now they're going to cause a problem. Yep, you have to take CoQ10. There's no way you can make it. So we're going to talk about that when we get to that slide. ACE inhibitors deplete zinc. That's interesting because you lose taste when you're zinc deficient. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Intriguingly, the ACE enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme makes a thing called angiotensin 2. That's where the COVID virus went in. It went in the angiotensin 2 receptor. That's why people got loss of taste. It was their zinc that went down because the COVID virus acted kind of like this drug, which is weird, right? And look what they had. They lost their taste. They had trouble breathing. They got sick. It's so interesting, right? And then they couldn't heal. And you can't make stomach acid. It's critical to make stomach acid or you can't kill any bacteria or viruses or yeast that comes into your stomach. You want a lot of acid so that you don't get what's called a dysbiosis in your intestines. So we don't want to be having not enough acid. And we said already you can get those lines. So some people need extra zinc. If you're losing your taste, you're getting coughing, you want to try a zinc lozenger. We're going to talk about more about that. And then some people are put on diuretics, although those are way out of favor with the medical community. Uh, you can't take a diuretic without the doctor. Look how many things are depleted. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, B1, B6, folic acid, CoQ10. This is huge. Look at all the side effects. So this is why the doctor is not loving their diuretics anymore, really going with ACE inhibitors, going with the beta blockers, going with metformin statin drugs. So really, what are we going to focus on here? We're going to talk about it again at the end of the presentation. We're going to need extra CoQ10 and zinc. Really important for cardiovascular disease. And we remember we said millions of people have cardiovascular disease. Number one cause of death in the U.S. and Canada, cardiovascular disease. So we got to stay on top of this. Why are they causing these problems? Well, statin drugs in particular block this HMG-CoA reductase. That enzyme lets you make cholesterol. So they don't want you to have extra cholesterol because cholesterol is what's part of the plaque. It doesn't cause the plaque. That's not the problem. It fixes the plaque. So saying that cholesterol is the bad guy, cholesterol is, is correlated but not causative with coronary artery disease. Meaning that if I have hypertension and I'm every minute on my blood vessels, I'm going to have to paint that over with something that's going to be stronger, that's going to be harder. So I'm going to have coronary artery disease because I'm going to put cholesterol there. It's going to be more hard so it can withstand hypertension. Hypertension, number one thing that you have to get rid of. What are the two things that really help you not be hypertensive? Fish oils and magnesium. So eating fish two or three times a week or taking a fish oil or having magnesium. And again, 80% of Americans are magnesium deficient. That's why cardiovascular disease is so really big, right? And now the beta blockers and the metformin deplete the CoQ10 because of the way that they're metabolized. So that's another big problem because I'm going to be exhausted because my mitochondria are the only thing making energy for me. And when the CoQ10 is not there because I cannot make it, I must take it. There's no way around it. Now here's, here's the rub. Say I'm not on a statin drug. Do I need CoQ10? I don't need it provided I have enough magnesium and enough vitamin C. But what if I'm a person who eats no fruits and vegetables? That's my problem. Because magnesium and vitamin C is necessary to make CoQ10 as well as all of these steps here. Very B vitamin dependent to do these steps, uh, but this is very magnesium dependent. So that's really the issue. So what do I need to mitigate all these drug-induced nutrient depletions? You need 100% of your B vitamins. You need 100% of your vitamin C. This is why I formulated the breakfast blend. That way you can be on a medicine and not feel bad about it. We all want to have quality of life. If we are a, uh, a heterosexual woman of reproductive age, we want to be able to be on birth control pills. If we are a woman who is over 50 and we're postmenopausal, we want to have hormone replacement therapy and we want to have it without side effects. And so therefore we need 100% of B vitamins and 100% of our vitamin C. If I'm a non-menstruating, anybody, child, adult, I only need eight milligrams of iron, but menstruating women actually need 18 milligrams of iron. And if I'm on 
all the things that deplete the iron, like the NSAIDs, or I am on, um, so the non natural anti-inflammatory is big, or I'm on an acid, now I'm going to have to take 18 milligrams of the iron, but I'm going to have to now do that where I actually have the iron with vitamin C, so like lemon and water, because that's going to be acidic enough that's going to help me absorb the iron. Again, hot water and lemon really doing great things for you or even cold water with lemon. I don't really care which way you do it, but putting lemon in the water, really, really helpful when you're taking your iron, you want to have that. Um, you want maybe tea with lemon and it, lemon ginger tea, something like that would be great. Um, I really like the iron bisglycinate or the fumarate form of iron. So iron is called ferrous. That's its normal thing. So um, for us in the breakfast blend, the iron is already in the pea and already in the cocoa. So we didn't add any iron. It has about seven and a half milligrams of iron in it. And iron at high levels is toxic for non-menstruating women. Uh, so you got it. those are the ones who need more. Pregnant women need even a little bit more than 18. So they could go up to 25 in their last trimester of extra iron. So just subtract this. So uh, make up the difference because this has eight. Uh, for calcium, I'm really a big fan of 350 to 500 milligrams as a supplement at any one time. I don't think you should do it too many times in a day. Once is great. You want to get the other 500 milligrams really from food. The literature on that is a lot better. I think there's a lot we don't totally understand about the whole thing with calcium that we make believe we do. I think it's really important to have it in food. And then you could take a supplement as well if you're really finding your calcium deficient. The ones that is not enough in the shake, right? This is just your background basal metabolic rate. But now I'm in a drug-induced nutrient depletion state. I'm going to need 100 milligrams of CoQ10. There's not CoQ10 in the shake because not everybody needs it. If I'm not on the big three MAPFORM and beta blockers and a statin drug, I can make it provided I have magnesium and vitamin C. Shake has both. Melatonin, remember there's all those things that deplete melatonin. It's going to be on its own slide. I'm not going to sleep well. I'm going to not get better from getting sick. I'm going to be very anxious and have mood disorders because melatonin is the anti uh, oxidant in the brain. It really calms your brain down. Uh, if I don't have enough zinc, I could lose my taste. I could start to lose my hair. I can have skin issues and poor wound healing. And then vitamin D, I, we're going to just talk about that. You got to have it measured and you got to get yourself in the range. That's the way to know what you need. And then we're going to figure it out because look at the problems with vitamin D. How do I know if I need vitamin D? Because I'm exhausted. I'm not sleeping well. My bones hurt. I have joint pain. I have muscle pain. I'm exhausted. I'm depressed and I'm sick all the time. <laughs> Maybe it's a vitamin D deficiency and not truthfully, I'm inflamed and I need a non steroidal anti inflammatory, just saying. All right, so who are they? Who are the CoQ10? This is a lovely picture of CoQ10, this is what it looks like. There's 10 of these called isoprenoid side chains. And then this ring here, very important to have magnesium and vitamin C. The isoprenoid side chain is made when you make cholesterol. So as long as you're not on a uh, statin drug, you should be able to make it. The beta blockers are going to deplete it because they're overusing it. If I'm depressed and I'm on uh, at what's called a tricyclic antidepressant, or I have a lot of pain and they put me on low-dose amitriptyline, I'm going to have to take CoQ10. So for chronic pain, uh, a lot of times, or even people have trouble sleeping, they'll sometimes give you a tricyclic antidepressant, which then you need CoQ10, you're going to be even more exhausted. And all the diabetic drugs deplete, especially metformin, but even these other ones that you have to look and see what drug you're on, uh, called the sulfonylureas, sulfonylureas, they deplete uh, CoQ10 as well. And if you're on Fosmax, that horribly depletes CoQ10. Um, I'm not going to talk about my opinion about Fosamax, that's up to you and your doctor, but we'll jump Fosamax is tough because it's going to cause horrible GERD as well. Very problematic drug. Better to do weight bearing exercise and eat your protein and your potassium and your magnesium and, uh, and your calcium, and then you'll be okay, hopefully. Melatonin is depleted by corticosteroids. That's prednisone, non steroidal anti inflammatories. That's you're in pain and you're not sleeping. SSRIs and the benzos. So now I'm depressed or anxious. Both of them deplete melatonin. Uh, Ritalin, I have ADD, huge, right? Or beta blockers. So what do I want? One to three milligrams, right? About an hour before you go to sleep. But I did a whole 
a PowerPoint and it's on our website and our YouTube channel on sleep and all the importance of sleep hygiene because melatonin is huge. It really helps your eyes be well uh, and really sleeping is really important for eye health. You won't get depressed and have seasonal affective disorders with enough melatonin and vitamin D intriguingly. Um, it's gonna support your immune system along with vitamin D and it's gonna help protect your mitochondria because it's a really important antioxidant and after your heart, your brain has the next most mitochondria. So you gotta sleep, sleep is not optional. And James Moss at Cornell says you need seven to eight hours of sleep every single day. Few people can get by with less. Zinc deficiency, you're going to be tired and, and listless and you can concentrate and you're going to have loss of your hair and weakened immune system and dry eyes and you can't smell and you can't taste and you have these white spots on your nails and your skin's not going to be good and you're going to have a horrible libido. So what are the things that do that? Antacids, H2 histamine blockers, um, NSAIDs, birth control, ACE inhibitors, and diuretics. So we really want to take a look, and the dose for that is five milligrams. There's slightly less than that in the shake. If you need it, do it as a lozenger. It tastes great when you need it. When you don't need it, it doesn't taste as great. So it's really good because zinc at high dose is not so great for you. You really want to try to stay in that right around that five milligram. Again, naturally occurring zinc comes in things like nuts and seeds. And then what about vitamin D? You really want your vitamin D. It's called 25 hydroxy vitamin D. You want your chiropractor uh, or your medical doctor to order it, whoever can order blood work. You want them to do it. You want them to do it in October. If you live in the Northern latitudes, it's gonna be the highest it's ever gonna be after the end of the summer. And it's only gonna go down from there until May. And you want to be ideally 40 to 60, 30 to 80 is the normal range. So um, I've had patients come in at 17. That's way too low. They're going to have to take a lot of vitamin D. They might need 5,000 international units. The RDA is only like 400 to 800, 5,000. If they give it to you, a medical doctor, they're going to give you 10,000. So you can do that, get the little uh, gel pills, or you can get the gummies, whatever you need to do. Just really see where you are. You want to have your blood work done. You want to be 40, 50, 60, something in that range. That's ideal. And I really believe uh, that you really should have it measured so you know how much you should take. You don't want to get way high, but you definitely don't want to get too low. Um, and then look at all the things, laxatives, SSRIs, steroids, statins, again, uh, seizure drugs, which people have got to be on those, and then a lot of weight loss drugs. So I wrote this just before the whole Gobi thing. So I have to look up if Gobi does that, but it's much likely that it causes you to be depleted in uh, vitamin D. So very, very important to do that. So if you have questions, you can email me at mbelliette at potentialpowernutrition.com. So it's great to be with you this evening and I'm gonna stop the video.